Uh, we're really excited to talk to you tonight because we're playing with some ideas. This is not like we've got the answer and we're going to tell you about it. This is a really hard problem. <laughs> it's, a, uh, it's on the scale of climate change. We talk about it as the sort of global climate change of culture that's caused by technology. Um, we often sometimes say that uh, unlike climate change, where you have thousands of companies and hundreds of countries that have to change what they're doing, only about 1,000 people in Silicon Valley, if they were to change, might be able to change this. We don't think it's that simple. It actually requires a movement. But I just want to lay out, this is very complicated. My goal for tonight is to have a dialogue with you and to lay out some ideas that represent how we might think about new solutions. Because we can't have 10 people or 20 people or 50 people in offices who know the answer are going to tell the whole world. We need to have lots of people thinking in a better way about what is the problem and how we can arrive at, at solutions. So um, we always start by saying, well, what's the real problem of, of humanity? Uh, E.O. Wilson, the father of sociobiology, Harvard professor, said the fundamental problem is that we have paleolithic emotions <laughs> medieval institutions, and godlike technology. So we're chimpanzees with nukes. And you if you have unprecedented capacity to enact consequences, you have to have unprecedented wisdom to guide that power. That's the core problem. But what I want to zero you in on is these paleolithic emotions, these ancient baked meat suit evolutionary emotions. When I was a kid, I was a magician. Magic actually teaches you to think in terms of the vulnerabilities of that meat suit. The fact that you're living inside of a meat suit brain mind that has certain limits, certain vulnerabilities, certain weaknesses. And while we were all looking out for the moment here in Silicon Valley when technology crosses the line of human strengths, that's when we think the singularity happens, that's when it takes our jobs, we miss this much earlier point when technology, like a magician, doesn't have to be smarter than you, it just has to know or overwhelm your weaknesses. And what we want to argue is that this diagnosis is the best diagnosis for describing why a number of the most important problems have gone wrong. If you zoom into that, what do we mean specifically? Well, take an example. Cognitive limits. Your brain has plus, seven plus or minus two short-term uh, memory. And when you overwhelm that, we feel that as information overload. Uh, when you take the dopamine system and you start playing with that and you overwhelm that, you feel that as addictive use. When you play with our weakness for social validation that we can helplessly, we cannot not pay attention when our social validation is on the line by others in terms of likes, et cetera, you get mass narcissism culture. Everyone has to be an influencer. Do I have as many followers as my friend? I have to take that photo down, et cetera. Uh, confirmation bias, that it feels good at a nervous system level to get information that affirms your worldview, and it feels bad to get information that doesn't. That's how you get fake news. And if you hack into our outrage, you get polarization. And if you hack into our trust, the limits of what we know, the basis of whether or not to trust something, you get deep fakes and bots, the sort of checkmate on your nervous system. So this is a very powerful diagnosis that explains why these seemingly separate problems on the right-hand problem, right-hand column, are going wrong, but they're all due to this one diagnosis. Now, if you look even deeper, so what do these issues lead to? Well, information overload leads to shortening of attention spans, social isolation, teen depression, suicide, uh, et cetera, post-truth world where you don't know what to believe, you're overwhelmed. The point is that this is a system of harms, an interconnected system. It's not some, oh, we got to whack them all over here. We got to whack the, the addiction problem. We got to whack the fake news problem. These are all connected problems, and we have to see it as a system that we call human downgrading, which is the climate change of culture. Because when we, have a, when we can see it as a system, it's sort of like people being obsessed with the coral reefs or just ocean acidification or just the whales instead of saying, oh my god, there's this bigger system that's causing all of these problems. And this is game over if we don't change it. Because it's degrading our sense making and our choice making at a, at a moment when we need that the most. So how do we fix it? Well, obviously, we just have to turn off our notifications. <laughs> That'll, that should do it. We, just, we turn our phones grayscale. That should like, solve the whole problem. That would be like being in the burning building that is climate change and saying, let's ban straws. <laughs> so obviously, we need to take seriously there's a 
deeper thing that's going on here. We need a systemic solution. And I can't say in front of you tonight that we can just like snap our fingers and all go do this one thing and it's all gonna happen. Because the real answer is we have to end attention and surveillance capitalism. The pairing of a business model that says the better I am at manipulating in real time your nervous system by knowing something about you that you don't know about yourself and being in a tight individual loop with you, that is the core problem. We can talk about that in the Q&A. There's a lot of ways that, in a long-term sense, we can do that. Regulation, dealing with the inflated sort of um, subprime attention economy, the fact that we're selling fake clicks, fake attention to fake users, bots. For fake reporting, Facebook was found to have inflated in one report by 900% uh, their reporting to advertisers. So there's a lot of ways to do this. Apple can do a lot as well, by the way. But what I want to get into is, um, how do we actually, with this audience, we're here in Silicon Valley, we also need to change the paradigm of thinking that we're coming from in how we're addressing these questions. So I just wanted to give you a sense of, first of all, our theory of change and explain how do we go about what we think is the way to change products. The ultimate goal, we want to change how technology is built, right? But how do we do that? We have to create the conditions for that to happen. So that happens through external pressure. This is policymakers, this is governments, this is media. This is um, uh, the public, this is parents, this is teachers, all of that. It's also internal pressure, the Facebook employees letter saying we have to do a better job with advertising. And it's also aspirational pressure, that there's, we're all warm next to this tire fire called human downgrading, and it's prof we're profiting. It's the only thing that our economic growth is uh, uh, profiting from, and we need to move to something else, but we don't even know what that looks like. So we need a kind of aspirational pressure. There's somewhere else we can go. And to do that, we need to ask transformative questions. Because the questions that we're asking about, well, how do we just like limit notifications? Are, it's, it's good, but we're not asking the transformative question that we would need to deal with the biggest part of the problem. So we obviously can't put the genie back in the bottle. We have the technology. It exists. So what are we going to do? So we look to systems change theorist Danella Meadows but a very powerful essay called um, Leverage Points uh, to Intervene in a System. And there's these 12 different leverage points, but the deepest leverage points is to actually change the mindset or paradigm from which all the assumptions, all the beliefs, all the design choices, all the understandings of human nature, et cetera, come from. Because you can tax you know, things at the edges, you can change the stocks and flows, you can uh, deal with the system in many different ways. You can change negative feedback loops, positive feedback loops. But the deepest way at scale is to change the way that people are even approaching these questions. So what is the paradigm that actually got us here? How were we thinking that we accidentally, because I don't believe people in Silicon Valley, anyone, wanted this to happen. Um, well, how do we get here? So let's take a look. I think if you went down the street a few blocks to um, General Assembly, you'd see a list kind of like this. So what were we believing? We have to give users what they want, the donut. We have to disrupt everything. Technology is neutral. We're just a tool. We're a neutral platform. Who are we to choose what's good for people? We shouldn't be the arbiters of truth. Uh, we should grow at all costs. So grow into Myanmar, grow into India, grow into all the markets, put free basics everywhere, be everywhere. Uh, designed to convert to drive user conversions. So get those conversions, get those users clicking, drive that actual outcome. And obsess over the metrics, obsess over the quantity of clicks, obsess over the engagement. Facebook to this day still prioritizes time spent. Um, and capture attention. So first of all, this is new stuff for us. What, is there anything missing from this list that you think? Do you think this is a pretty good list? How many of you would sort of nod your heads feel like this is a pretty decent, decent list? If you walked a few blocks away to General Assembly, you would find them teaching product management courses that would basically be this worldly. This is almost word for word, especially we've worked on this topic for about seven years. This is what we hear from the, the mouths of, of technologists. So if this, um, this essentially represents two different pieces of a sort of things fall out of this. One is a minimization of responsibility. And a second is commodifying human experience. That human experience is a commodity, it's a resource and we can treat it fun as fungible, and we can just kind of get it to do what we want. And these are the categories of the fundamental flaw, we think, in the paradigm. So this, running in the mind of a technologist, is what created all of this. 
right? When you have, give users what they want, disrupt everything, you get information overload, mass narcissism, addictive use, et cetera. So if this isn't the paradigm, this obviously, you know, again, no one intended for this to happen, but this was a way of thinking. So what is the alternative new way to think about these things? So I can't tell you here that we have the perfect list of the new principles that are gonna guide us towards some perfect new utopia. What we can do is ask for these existing beliefs, what would be the update that we would wanna make to that, right? So instead of giving people what they want, how about, like a magician, let's understand what people's vulnerabilities are. And seeing, like the matrix, the code that's running on other people that cause them to be vulnerable or do what they do. So what causes them to pick item number one or two on the menu? What causes them to pick that A-B tested, emotionally resonant word in that political ad? Right, so seeing the world in terms of human vulnerabilities. The second is, instead of disrupting everything, if we find and strengthen the things that we're already brilliant as human beings at doing with each other. We're actually really brilliant at uh, uh, finding common ground over dinner conversations. We're really brilliant at building trust face to face. We're really good at building empathy in that sort of face to face loop. If you take an example of um, uh, cyberbullying, if I say something and bully you face to face as a child, my nervous system automatically has on my balance sheet feel the thing that I cause you to feel when I see your facial expression shift. So we automatically have all the brilliant closed loop type uh, uh, relationships that we've evolved for millions of years to have, but we need to find and strengthen existing brilliance instead of disrupting everything. We can still enhance it, by the way, with technology. Uh, and then instead of uh, technology's neutral, we realize that we're the urban planners for the social fabric. We are actually organizing the wiring diagram of the flows of human attention, the terms and bases of people's relationships, when we make decisions about email, Snapchat, Snapstreaks, uh, messaging, et cetera. Uh, instead of, uh, sorry, instead of who are we to choose, we realize that it's no, there's no such thing as not choosing. When you choose, you, you are making a conscious choice when you're not choosing, be conscious of what that choice is and be aware of what values you wanna promote. Uh, instead of growth at all cost, make sure that growth and scale are always bound to responsibility and accountability. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, instead of designing to convert users' behavior to narrow their experience like a sheep, we design, design to enhance people's own capacity for greater sense-making, more omni-considerate choice-making. And instead of obsessing over metrics, we ask, how can we obsess over the things that really matter in people's lives and at this moment in history? And instead of trying to capture attention, we ask, how would we regenerate people's attention and nurture their own capacity and awareness? So attention is, is really sacred. It's, the, last, it's the, fi the one last finite resource we have, and that's why the attention economy and this finite zero-sum land grab is what got us here. So let's take a look uh, at this list. And what's different about this list is the first part is that we're actually embodying responsibility. So from minimizing responsibility to embodying responsibility. And the second part is actually, instead of commodifying human experience, to enhance the capacities for wisdom. I don't mean this in a fluffy way, I mean this in a genuine way. Like people having a higher awareness from which that is the basis of the way that they make choices. So, let's actually imagine a problem. Like information overload. Oh my God, we're so overloaded. I could give you 100 stats. Our attention spans now are 40 seconds is the average time before we switch tasks, which is ridiculous. Uh, book reading is on the decline. We all know the sort of issues with this. How could we have ever created a problem like information overload? Well, when you think about this, you can see the ways that if you're giving people what they quote unquote want, the want is in quotes, we assume technology is neutral. Who are we to choose what's good for people? We just drive that growth at all costs. We get that clickbait going. We reinforce the thing in your nervous system. We get the outrage because it works better. Every word of moral outrage you add to a tweet increases its retweet rate by 13%, uh, and we capture attention. This outcome is obviously not by accident. So let's ask, now imagine we're trying to solve that problem from this paradigm. It's very hard to solve this problem from this paradigm. You can't. So let's try to imagine this other paradigm. Now think about, and I'm not saying I have the answer to information overload. I'm asking you and the people in the tech industry watching this, when you see information overload as a problem of human vulnerabilities, what are the things that pull us into other experiences? The infinite scroll, the ding, and then something like 70% of people uh, respond or look at a text message within a, two minutes of its arrival. It's, it's just ridiculous. We're so vulnerable to these things. 
Um, if you're trying to find and strengthen existing human brilliance, what are the ways that we're naturally brilliant at dealing with information and being overloaded? What are the ways that we are naturally more centered, more grounded? How would you design to strengthen, for example, people's uh, breathing or how much time they spent walking before they walk into that information overload type situation? It's not just about providing the better tech answers, it's about asking at a human level, how can we, how can we strengthen that existing brilliance? Um, we're constructing the social world. How are we wiring up people's relationships that they get overloaded? I hope you get a sort of a taste of what this looks like. And if you go back, this is kind of funny for me because we were talking as a team about this example. This is an example that came from a TED talk that um, I gave in Brussels in 2014, which was about distraction and imagining that there's this person on the left. Um, sorry, so let's imagine we're thinking about distraction in terms of people's vulnerabilities, strengthening their existing brilliance, and nurturing their own awareness. So that we're thinking in, this, in these terms about the problem of distraction. So, We've got these two people. On the left, you have, uh, I think it's Nancy. On the right, you have John, who's, so Nancy's working on a document. On the right, you have John. And then John realizes, oh, sorry, first Nancy gets to say that she's focused. And then John says, oh, shoot, I need to ask Nancy for that document before I forget. And so he opens up a chat window, except now there's this marking of that he's focused. So when he sends the message, we have to make sure we're giving him the capacity to get this off of his mind to regenerate his attention, because otherwise that would loop on his mind if he's sitting there like, oh, I don't want to interrupt her. I see that she's busy, but then I, I have to hold it on my balance sheet. That's going to be expensive. We have to get it off of his, his balance sheet, also not on Nancy's balance sheet, and manage the global flows of attention in a social way, nurturing the awareness of both parties, and hold the messages so that it stays there. right? So this is hopefully in terms of thinking about how are people vulnerable to that. For example, there's a cognitive bias in our um, brain called false urgency, that when something comes and it dings you, you get this sort of urgency. You, have, you falsely apply urgency to the situation that, that isn't actually there. So this is one example. OK, so let's take a problem like polarization. Well, how would we have ever gotten a problem like polarization? Well, we're giving users what they want. Uh, we're disrupting everything. Who are we to choose what's good for people or what's true? Don't make us the arbiters of truth. Grow at all costs. Design to create conversions, maximize clicks, et cetera. If you're trying to solve for polarization within this paradigm, it's very, very hard. Right? How, how would you do it? You try to re-rank news feeds a little bit, but you're still, this is the fundamental ideology out of which all of these solutions are fall falling. So if you try to solve polarization a different way and say, okay, let's, let's ask the questions. How are we vulnerable to polarization? Meaning, what are those things that trigger us into a separating, disconnecting, you're not human, you're someone else, I don't even know how to relate to you, you're totally different, right? Um, how would we see what are those triggers, those vulnerabilities that drive us into that state, finding it and strengthening what are the natural peacemaking, what are the natural contexts in which we're really naturally brilliant at seeing across different lines? How are we constructing the social world? For example, am I giving, I could construct a wiring diagram where everybody who uh, feels one way about gun control is exposed day after day after day to everybody who feels maximally on the other side of gun control. That's sort of like the worst case scenario of polarization. How can I differently construct that wiring diagram? Um, and how can I nurture the awareness, for example? There's a lot of things. I'm, I'm giving you the tools so that you can think about these questions. And so here's an example where if you take, you know, thinking in terms of vulnerability, strengthening our existing brilliance, and uh, nurturing awareness, Living Room Conversations is an example of an organization that sets up these Zoom chats about topics from across the divide, where small group conversations, not 100 people in a Zoom chat, not a dinner table with 100 people, that doesn't scale to the vulnerabilities, the sort of social dynamics of human brilliance, but six people or five people split evenly across party lines with good facilitation. And this has actually been really great and working. Um, things like letter.wiki. This is an example of an organization that has built. Notice that the, um, the founding fathers, and in many different cases, we used to write these long letters to each other. We used to have correspondence. We used to write these big ideas. So if you debate something like climate change, there's a real complexity to the trade-off between climate change work and economic growth. What's that right trade-off? There's a, there's a more compl complex discussion to have. If you have the discussion on Twitter, how does that go wrong? You could just imagine, right? You get context collapse. Someone takes something said out of context. That creates silencing, chilling effects. Now I don't want to say anything. So you get this whole ecology of things going wrong, whereas this is two people, public intellectuals or people who are kind of engaged in the issue, have a conversation in public with respect, with trust, long form letter writing in the public, but they're not trolled by everybody else in the process. There's ways to design the system differently. 
Let's take one last topic of learned helplessness. So why would we experience learned helplessness uh, from this paradigm of giving, giving users what they want, disrupt everything, who are we to choose, growth at all costs? Why would we get learned helplessness from, let's say, news feeds? Well, when you're bombarded with news like this every single day, um, it's kind of clear, right? And if you thought about this, we were giving people what they wanted, we were driving conversions, we were capturing attention, and who's to say what's good for people? Because we're just giving people, and this is good, I mean, we want people to certainly have an awareness about climate change, but is this the way that we want reinforced with two billion people's nervous systems? 2.7 billion people, when they click on climate change, you keep clicking on it, you get this sort of loop of basically the apocalypse, and your newsfeed looks like the apocalypse after just a few things, right? So, and when you're living in this paradigm, what else could you do? You could give people different news about climate change, different news clickbait about climate change. But that's not enough, right? So imagine we flip these around. We say, OK, what if we were asking, you know, how are people vulnerable to learned helplessness? What are the vulnerability points where you feel lack of agency? Because you don't feel like there's any choices you can make. Um, oops, sorry, let me go back. Um, and uh, oops, I keep doing that. I'll do this one more time. I think I got it. So uh, this is look in terms of vulnerabilities, enable wise choices, meaning what are the, if we heighten people's own sense making and capacity around what are the choices that most matter with climate change, instead of dosing people with learned helplessness and endless articles about the apocalypse, you could be giving people collective actions that they could take with other people and try to create act empowered action, nurturing higher awareness, higher choice making. So um, this is just a set of examples and a set of tools to think about these things. Right? If you think about how much needs to change, the only way to do that is to have everybody in a decentralized way asking deeper questions, uh, better questions, and having better conversations in their company instead of just we're giving people what they want and there's no conversation to have after that. And why must we change paradigms? Why is this so important and so urgent? because the complexity of our problems is going up. Our problems are getting more, we're generating with exponential tech, increasing problems. And our capacity to respond to those problems as human beings, as a civilization, has been, in general, it, it would tap out, right? We're creating problems beyond our response capacity. Um, a friend of, uh, of our community, Zach Stein, says it's when the task demands of civilization exceed the capacities of that civilization to respond to them. This is an existential situation. And the biggest meta problem is that our biggest problems are exceeding our capacity to solve them. The reason why this threat is so urgent and why all of us have to be part of the solution is because human downgrading takes this and it does that to it. We are making, it's degrading our sense of what is true, of what actions we can take instead of how helpless we should feel how empowered we feel, whether people can date or they feel lonely and they're swiping, while they're like, right? This entire thing, we have to reverse human downgrading. And we all have to be part of that solution. We have to turn it from a graph that looks like this into a graph that looks like this at a systemic level. So we have to upgrade our, our capacity to respond to this. That means better sense making, better choice making. That doesn't mean better news articles and better news feeds, it means in a deep way, what is good sense making around these problems? How much time is there to uh, deal with the methane bomb and the permafrost? What can we do about, is geoengineering safe or not? These are important questions that there has to be deep, sophisticated conversations about, not lightweight, uh, naive conversations about. Now, while this might seem depressing, and it might seem impossible, I'm gonna tell you why at least we as an organization wake up every day, and why you're here hopefully in the room, and why we have, we have hope. Because when I, as an example, in my own experience of working on these issues, um, in, in 2013, there was a presentation that I made inside of Google that was basically saying, hey guys, I think that we've enabled this channel in which we're enabling people's cognitive biases to be hijacked, and it was called a call to minimize distraction, worried that distraction at a mass level would be sort of this, this big existential problem. And for two years, I was like walk, running around Google, and I was trying to get product teams to say, like, what can we do about this? Like, we got to do something. We got to deal with notifications. We have to change the way app incentives work. We have to do all these, these things. And nothing changed for, for just forever, like two and a half years. And if you ask, if you imagine just like stepping into the shoes of, of anyone in a situation like this, 
you're talking about changing something so big, you would never think that anything could change. People would literally say, this is just crazy. It can't be changed. And I watched how through public awareness and certain phrases getting out there, very carefully crafted memetics, phrases like the attention economy or time well spent, that was 60 minutes, time well spent entering the, the, the dialogue, discourse, product development rooms, people coming out to speak about these issues. Roger McNamee, who's a, our friend and co-founder of CHT, who wrote the book Zucked, uh, uh, people like Jaron Lanier, who've been an advocate for these issues and trying to fix uh, surveillance capitalism. Zeynep Tufexi, uh, Rene Deresta, who did the Senate Intelligence Report and been a, a very close collaborator. Guillaume Chaslow, a YouTube whistleblower, saying, hey, there's a serious problem here. Chris Hughes, when I last gave this presentation, it was before Chris Hughes, the co-founder of Facebook, said it's time to break up Facebook. If you told me back then that all those things would have, would have happened, I would have never believed you. The amount of change and the rate of change in which things are changing is, is just going up by so much that you know, a year ago, The Verge said the time well spent debate is one. If you don't know, time well spent was the name of our first sort of uh, entree and, and movement into these issues. Uh, why did The Verge say that? Because Mark Zuckerberg in January 2018 said that our goal for the company this year is to make sure people spent time is time well spent. This was more than just greenwashing, even though it did have a massive greenwashing component. There are actually teams inside of Facebook who measured meaningful social interactions. Entire product development teams were asked to actually think differently about these problems. Apple launched screen time features on phones. They just re released it to all of the, uh, the Macs that are out there. So on more than probably a billion and a half devices, some of the audience can confirm. There's now time well spent type features running out there in the world. YouTube, time well spent. The most encouraging news is actually people inside of Facebook standing up and saying, we, this is still our company. This is our company. Free speech and paid speech are not the same thing. And through in more memetics, things like free speech is not the same thing as free reach, one of the memes that we tried to really push and get out there. And then you have Jack Dorsey tweeting in his ban on political ads, the reason that this isn't about free expression, it's about paying for reach. So how much can change? I'm not, this is not like, oh, like we did this. It's not that conversation. This is a how much can change when everyone says, I'm not part of the problem. I'm part of the solution. And we speak in a higher uh, language and frame about what that change looks like.